have a special presentation of our Ink Pot Award, which is going to go to Mr. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> the Ink Pot Award is an award that is given for a lifetime achievement in comics, film, television, and pop culture. And as I'm sure all of you are aware, Mr. Spielberg has definitely contributed to our pop culture love. And, and with that, uh, I believe we have a clip to kind of remind us of all the things that, uh, and all the reasons why we love Mr. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> without you supporting these movies and supporting what we do and, you know, staying kids, no matter what your age, you're kids and you'll be kids the rest of your lives. I feel the same way. I've been a child all my life. I asked my wife, you know, I'm not ready to grow up. If I start growing up, I'll actually, that's when I'll start, stop making movies, which I don't intend to do. But, but really, thank you so much. Um, you know, we all love the same source material that has brought all of us here. And the source material has always been uh, the collective imaginations of so many brilliant, brilliant artists and storytellers that have just given us our waking hours, our, 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 our dream state hours, so much material to live by. And um, I just feel very lucky that I can be a part of you. I feel like I should be out there in the audience with you and not standing up here. We're all in the same world together, and with us keep, let's keep working together. Thank you for this. Thank you so much. So now that we've got a reminder of some of the past projects, I'm sure all of you are excited to see one of the new ones. Right? Right? So, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the Tintin 10 panel, Mr. Jeff Boucher of the LA Times and HeroComplex.com. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Tom H. Steven Spielberg. Come on. What? Steven, you know, um, tell us about where it began for you with Tintin. A lot of people come to uh, Tintin when they were young, but not a lot of people in America did. Uh, when did you come to Tintin? Well, what I'm curious to know is, how many here have ever read a Tintin book? Okay, that, make, that makes my job a lot easier in order to answer your question, because Tintin, you know, in the 1920s by Hergé has been embraced, and kids all over Europe, Asia have grown up with Tintin, not as much in North America. Um, I didn't know much about Tintin at all. I didn't know anything about Tintin until I read a French review in 1981 of Raiders of the Lost Ark that kept comparing my movie to something called Tintin. I did not know what they were talking about. I got one of the books. It was all in French. I don't read French, but I could read the story just based on the illustrations, the amazing artwork, the characters, the humor, the plot. It was all il illustrative. It was done by Hergé. I didn't need to read the words. When I got to the end of it, I could see their point. I could see a little bit of a, it was a bit of a cousin. And, and what do you think the commonality was? Is it sort of the globe trotting, the sense of adventure, that sort of thing? Or? Well, you know, just, just that, uh, you know, in the world of Urge, Tintin was a reporter. And you're not supposed to do this when you're a journalist. You know this. <laughs> but Tintin, you know, kind of put himself into the stories he was supposed to be reporting on, and Tintin became the story. In a sense, Indiana Jones is sent out to you know, to find and unearth some kind of antiquity, often a paranormal antiquity, and he gets very, very involved more in the story of the adventure than in the mission of what he's actually trying to accomplish. In that sense, there is a kinship between both genres. 
You know, speaking of Indiana Jones, uh, last month was the 30th anniversary of Raiders of Lost Ark. And on behalf of the world, I just want to say thanks again for that. <laughs> it's a pretty perfect film. Now, you know, with a movie like this, um, uh, it's performance capture, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about that. You know, I, I guess the first thing I want to ask you, though, is when you're casting, you've never done a performance capture film like this, uh, where do you start with casting on something like that? Well, when I'm casting something like this, you start the way you cast a normal movie. You find the best actor for the part. Uh, because the actors simply, as, as you probably all know by now, the actors, you know, you don't, you don't identify, let's say, Daniel Craig, who's in our movie. You won't see Daniel's face, but you'll actually see every nuance of his performance through the very thin digital skin of the character that was created uh, by Weta, uh, Peter Jackson's company. Um, but, you, you, you know, you also, in order to, I have to make the decision, do I shoot this movie live action with a digital dog, or do I shoot this movie, do I animate the film? And so I went to Weta and I asked them to do me a test. Show me what a digital dog looks like up against a human character, preferably a character in a costume um, from, the, uh, from, from Tintin. Okay. And that's how I started this entire wow. process. And, and when was that? Was that? That was six years ago. That was a long time ago. Well, you know, we actually have that, don't we? Don't we have that test? I think we. You want to see the test? We shot. Hello, Peter. <laughs> You know what, Steven Spielberg pirated that test because that was supposed to be destroyed six years ago. <laughs> dear, oh dear. It was, when, it was when Steven saw that plonker on screen that this, he decided this film could never be live action. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Jackson, obviously. Welcome to uh, San Diego. <laughs> Peter, we know you have your hands full in New Zealand. It's wonderful to see you here. Uh, probably speaks to how excited you are about this collaboration. Tell us a little bit about working with Stephen on this. That must have been very exciting for you. Oh, well, obviously working with Stephen's been pretty amazing. Um, you know, I think he shows real promise. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if he decides to stick with filmmaking, I think he could, he could really go places. <laughs> no, it's been, it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, the, the weird thing is that because Stephen got the rights to Tintin back in 1983, I mean, I was a young filmmaker, I was actually halfway through making Bad Taste back then. And, um, and so I read magazines, you know, read uh, stories about Stephen and hear about him making Tintin. So I, I, was, a, I was a huge Tintin fan, I you know, read the books, collected the books since I was five or six years old. And I was looking forward to Stephen's Tintin movie. And I was kind of looking forward to it for a quarter of a century. <laughs> and, um, and you know, you, ca you can't imagine the mind-blowing moment when Stephen invited me on board. You know, very difficult decision, had to think about it for two, three seconds. Um, but it's been an absolute joy. Absolute pleasure. You know, we, we know we, in, in a sense, what really bonded us on this is we come at it different ways. Peter learned how almost to read reading Tintin when he was a little boy, and I came at, at it uh, as an adult. Uh, from the story I just told you, but in the sense that we're both Tintin fans, and that's the reason we collaborated on this from the very beginning. What did you see as the biggest challenge with this particular property or this project? <laughs> well, I think it was just getting the uh, you know story told to the to, to the to the extent that we wanted the movie to look like the drawings in the Urge albums and all the Urge adventures. We didn't want to cast actors to look like the actors we cast and then have everybody say, well, it was good, but they, they sort of looked like Captain Haddock or like the Thompson Twins or, or like Tintin himself, but it wasn't exactly a direct translation. Art, art. You're all here because you love art. We all love art. We love art so much we wanted to honor Urge by using animation to get as close as we could to the characters he invented, not characters that we would then reinvent based on big names, big movie stars, that would look like big movie stars. And I mean, you know, the idea with the, the, the look of it was, as Stephen says, to, to create, you know, characters in a 3D world, in an animated world, that look as close as we could certainly get to, get to um, Haddock and Tintin and the Thompsons and the other characters, but we also wanted to make it as much of a hybrid of, of um, animation and 
and live action as we possibly could. So we wanted, even though the, the characters have these, you know, these, uh, these faces that you could never find in a real human being, we still wanted to have the pores in the skin, the, the freckles, the stubble, the, the sweat. You know, we wanted to have it a sort of have, have a texture and a detail, a level of detail that, that was, you know, you're never going to believe that it, it, it's live action. It almost looks like live action. Um, so, and, and that, that also extended to the filmmaking that we wanted, um, because neither Stephen and I are very good on computers, we, we wanted to find, I mean, I can I can barely send an email, no, true, I mean, he's a little bit better than I am, but I, I can't, I, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to create a, a, a version of, of um, animation and motion capture that allowed the, the filmmaker, allowed Stephen to step inside this, this sort of virtual world that we created with the characters, with the, um, the locations and the sets, which were all built over a two or three year period ahead of, ahead of the actual shoot. But, but Stephen could shoot the movie. I mean, you know, there's a lot talked about animation, motion capture, but this is like a hybrid where Stephen had a, a virtual camera and was able to step in and film it almost as if it's a live action film. And just, just as a fan of Stephen's work, I mean, one of the things about Tintin that I, I'm always excited about whenever I, I see um, the, the movie in its, in, in its different stages is that it's a film that Stephen personally shot. I mean, he had the camera in his hand the whole time. And so it's, it, it was almost like shooting out the, the old eight millimeter films. It was it? like, it was, it was the closest experience to, because I had to do, I think, because it was a, like, it's like a PlayStation game controller with a six inch co color monitor in between. And you, you're, you're all completely up to date about this technology, but you look up and you see actors in motion capture suits in a white basketball court, we call the volume. But I look, would look down into the monitor and there would be the characters, the actual, in, you know, real time, tin tin, not, not, you know, fully animated, but, you know, that we'll give you a little sample in a few minutes, but enough that I could actually be in the world of Tintin getting all of my shots and planning all of my angles. You know, you said, uh, I saw you quoted uh, maybe almost a year ago saying that this movie made you feel more like a painter than you had ever felt, and, and that speaks to that sort of, the technology distilling the filmmaking process. It does, because one person can do the lighting, can push the camera, can be the electrician, the dolly grip, can, can tweak the makeup, the hair, it really is more, it gets, even, even though there's hundreds of animators that have to animate, you know, five hours to animate every single frame of this film. Still, putting together the story and putting together the actual performance capture, you do a lot of jobs at the same time, which I normally do through very, very talented, you know, 15 to 100 to 200, you know, people on our crew. But this is much more of a direct to canvas art form, I found. Steven Spielberg, Dolly Griff. <laughs> 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 so Peter, you know, one of the things that uh, you were talking about, Tintin, earlier uh, when we were chatting about it was that um, it means different things to different readers at different ages. That was very interesting. Some of the nuances and layers. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, my experience with Tintin is looking at the books before I could read, really, when I was five, six years old. Um, and then, you know, you, you look at the pictures, you can follow the stories, because Hergé designed these books often like storyboards. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost like silent movies, although once you do learn to read, you, you start to realize how, how um, anarchic some of the characters are and how, how exciting the stories are. And, and, but, you know, I looked at Tintin when I was young as my, like, the older brother I never had, and they, having the adventures that I dreamt of having, but, you know, Part of me didn't ever want to get shot at or have to, um, uh, you know, get get chased by bad guys. So it, it's, it, it has that, you know, that, that wonderful escapist quality. But then, as you get older and um, you look at the books as an adult, there's layers of um, social kind of social statement that Hergé uh, was making because he wrote these books between 1927, 28, um, and right into the 1980s. And so that's, you know, those decades, a lot happened in the world and especially in Hergé's life, um, you know, before World War II, during and then after World War II. And, uh, and, and you start to appreciate the world that he was living in and the satire and the, and, 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 and the, um, the parody that he was putting into, and some, some actual, some serious statements as well. But also you, you recognize the, the influences that he was under because there's definitely a love of Hollywood adventure films in, the, in those stories. And there's um, silent movies, Buster Keaton, yep. Charlie Chaplin, um, so, you know, when we were making the film, 
we kind of wanted to make it, uh, to, to try to have the different layers that Hegé had built into it. We, we haven't tried tonally to do anything different at all than what 